Hey everybody, Gary here with Pal Music, and in this video, we're gonna go really deep on how to play Jimi Hendrix's solo from the original recording of Hey Joe. So the last lesson I posted on the channel before the holidays, I know it's been a while since my last video, we went over how to solo over Hey Joe using some of Hendrix's triad ideas, which he didn't actually use on this solo. He uses them in the Little Wing solo. He uses it a lot when he's mixing lead and rhythm guitar, but his studio solo here is just purely E minor pentatonic with one little E major pentatonic riff at the end. So in this video, I'm gonna go riff by riff, break it down real slow. We're gonna go into how I'm playing it, how Hendrix might've been playing it a little different, some of the technique things that will help you play in this style. The main mission here at Pal Music is learn, create, share. So step one, we're learning, and we're learning in a way that is deeper than just learning where to put your fingers on the fretboard. Create, so we wanna take some of these ideas from Jimmy, and we want to create our own thing. So I'm gonna play the backing track that I used later in the video where we could try to workshop some of these riffs and make them our own, right? So as an example from later in the video, I take this little riff and then just workshop it by changing it up a little bit to incorporate it into my own vocabulary. the great vocabulary of the greats that we know and love, and then we want to expand on it and make it our own. And then as far as sharing goes, of course, there's nothing better than getting out there and playing with people in real life. But in addition to that, or as a step along the way to getting there, you could always join my guitar community at patreon.com slash palmusic, where many of us get together twice a week in a small group on Zoom. We play together, we learn different things, we explore these concepts together. It's both a lesson and a jam session. So link to that is in the description. As always, if you want to follow along with the tab, the numbers on the lines, both as a PDF or playable tab that you could open in a program like Guitar Pro, that's available for Pal Music patrons. By supporting on Patreon, you'll have instant access to everything I've ever posted on the site, all the resources to go along with all my YouTube videos, twice weekly live small group Zoom guitar hangouts that we have, worksheets, backing tracks, and lots of other cool stuff. So the link to that is in the description. Also, before we get started, we're about to start the winter 2023 Fret Live Fretboard Mastery Program. I believe this is the seventh time I'm doing the live version of my flagship course where we start from the very beginning of music theory as it's laid out on the fretboard, the 12 notes we have, and then from them how we create a key, from the key how we create chords, how we could play those chords all over the fretboard, how we could take a couple notes away to get the pentatonic scale, how we could learn pentatonic from diatonic or diatonic from pentatonic and see how those two relate. We get into the cage system, part one, two, and three. After basic triads, we get into seventh chords, sus chords, ninth chords, sixth chords, add nine, all that other good stuff. And finally, we end with modes. And each step of the way, there's song learning examples and creative assignments so that you're applying each step of the way and it's not just you know something abstract. That's what we try to do here with these lessons and that's what we do throughout the course just in a very sequential way. All of the videos have the Fret Live animations, so if you jive with this method and you really want to have a deeper understanding of how music works on the fretboard, check it out. Link is in the description. All right, let's get into it. So just like the Little Wing solo, we start with the same exact note, almost the same phrase. We're taking the note D and we're bending it up to the note E. So this is the flat seven, and we're bending it up to the root, right? So that 15th fret, we wanna bend, and then give it some vibrato. Just this right here, like spend as much time as you can on just that, right? So you wanna have a lot of control of this bend, and the way that I recommend you bend the note is that you do this kind of fulcrum technique, right? Where the side of your hand is touching the neck at all times and you're just using this as a pivot point. So I'm putting my third finger on that 15th fret 
and I'm mostly just using my wrist and this forearm muscle to bend. I'm not using my fingers so much to bend as much as my forearm and turning my wrist, right? So it's going on this fulcrum. And then when I get it to the top, I'm just very slightly jiggling the note to get that vibrato. And you want to test your tuning, right? So we want to get the note E. So we're bending from the 15th fret to the set to the sound of the 17th fret. Right? Then after that, we're playing a unison, the same exact note, but now on the 12th fret of the high E string, right? So we're bending to the E with vibrato, but then we hit the 12th fret on the high E string, which is the same exact note. That's a very bluesy thing to do in itself. Just, you know, reminds me of, um, what's that song by Chuck Berry? Uh, Johnny Be Good, right? Very bluesy thing to do. Now, Hendrix probably kept his index finger kind of planted as a bar on that 12th fret so that when he, when he played that high E string, his finger was already down like that, right? So he definitely had longer fingers, more flexible than mine. I don't necessarily keep my finger down there as much as Hendrix, you know, watching footage definitely did. So I'm doing more of a, right? I'm kind of putting that finger down there when I'm ready for it. Whereas Hendrix probably kept it down more. Whatever works for you, right? So, and then come back down. Then we do this. So this is also a really classic blues move where we take the fourth and we bend it up to the fifth. And then we drop it down and then we pull off. So just that, three notes, one pick, right? One pick, up, down, pull off. So we go up, down, pull off. Then we hit the root and then back to the flat third. So. Now the beauty of practicing without the backing track is you could really hear when you're getting extraneous string noise, right? Like notes ringing out you don't want to. So try to use your palm to mute the low few strings if you're not playing them. And then use this index finger to mute these strings, right? So I'm kind of controlling which strings could ring out. And the more distortion you have on, the bigger a deal this is because the distortion really compresses everything. It brings the subtle noise. It makes it much louder. It amplifies the low noises. It kind of squashes everything and makes everything stand out. So, so it's one thing to get the riff, but then to get it without the extraneous noise. And then a little vibrato at the end. Then the second time, we're gonna hold this double stop. So we're gonna go, and then hit this double stop. And still go, but while holding that double stop. Right? So Hendrix, again, probably kept that finger down. And he probably used no pinky here. I would imagine he went. More like that. But to me, that's not as comfortable as using the pinky. Right? So I'm going to go. And then.
Now this whole part, you know, you could double stop these notes or play them as single notes. So you can go, or you could go, right? It sounds thicker if you add double stops. That's the beauty of pentatonic pattern one is you could always double stop notes with your index finger because they're all stacked on the same fret. Now, of course, we do a little bend on this 12th fret because that's the minor third to the major third, right? The chord is E major. So, right, so this is the major third on the 13th fret of the G string. And stylistically in the blues, we're often taking the minor third and bending it up to the major third. So we got. Right, then we just alternate between those. So that riff as single notes is just. But if I add double stops like this one and this one, then I've got. And that sounds great. It really thickens it up. Then we do this dramatic slide. But again, a little bit of a bend on that minor third. And then again, up to that same note we started on. Now I'm doing this little thing. I think Hendrix does it in there, but this is, a, I, I always associate this with BB King, where I rake the strings below, below in pitch, the note that I'm hitting right before a bend. It gives it a thick attack. The word attack means the, the first, the very first moment you hear a note. It's also called the transient. So the transient is kind of like the way the note begins, the quality of the very first moment you hear the note. Transient as it's just for a split second, right? But so we can give it a nice big thick transient or attack by raking into the note. So I just use my palm to mute the low uh, three strings so that I can actually play them on my way to the note that I'm going to bend. Now, the hardest riff comes right now. One thing that Hendrix did stylistically that a lot of people get wrong is he would go in and out of swing. He would swing notes, then he would not swing. Swing, not swing. So what do I mean by not swing? So if this is the beat, the next phrase goes... No swing, straight 16th notes. Whereas swing would be... Right. Also, the beginning of uh, of Little Wing, where he goes, boom, boom, chucka, do we da do do do, no swing. But then he starts to swing, ba 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 ba. So he mixed swing with no swing, which is kind of dramatic. It's it's a really cool effect. So the next phrase, there's no swing. All right, everybody. So that concludes the phrase by phrase breakdown available here on YouTube. If you want to see the rest of the breakdown for the rest of the solo in the same way, that's available for my Pow Music patrons. And the link is in the description. If you're not a patron, you could click that link and sign up and go directly to the rest of this lesson. So now we're gonna skip over the rest of the phrase by phrase breakdown and go to the end where we go over taking these riffs and workshopping them 
to make them your own. All right, everybody. So now that you learn those phrases, let's workshop them. So I'm going to put on a backing track. I'm going to show you how I'm workshopping the riffs. And then I want you to do the same thing over the backing track, which is linked in the description. I'll put a little bit of the backing track here, you know, just 20 seconds or so, or just through the chord progression a couple times. But if you just want to jam on this backing track, it's in the description. All right. So now I'm going to play off some of his ideas, meaning I'm, I'm going to workshop them. So what makes up his ideas? The note choices, the rhythms, uh, and those are the things I could play with. I could keep the same rhythm, change the notes. I could keep the I could keep the same notes, change the rhythm. I can just slightly change it or change it completely. I can start a riff one way, end it another way, or start it a new way and end it the same way, right? So that's a bear. Bear, say hello. Uh, the camera can't see you. His head is literally <laughs> right where it's cut off. So one way to workshop the riff is to think about it as a gesture. So if the gesture is... Now I could move that gesture to a new string group. Or... Or... Right? I just moved the movement to a different string group within the scale. That's one thing. I can start the riff, but end it differently. So it starts, and then I could do something different after that. So I can go. I just ended it differently. It still started, and then I went. So maybe I start it differently, but end it with the so or keep all the same notes but change the rhythm. So instead of ba da ga da 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 da, maybe I go So I still went almost unrecognizable but same movements. Right? I'm just rearranging the idea completely. Let's do that over a backing track. So I'm just going to keep going on that first riff. So originally it was something like... workshopping it, right? I could do this over and over. Let's look at a different riff. Just as another example, the riff that went. beating a dead horse, but that's okay. So as a gesture, I could move it to new strings. So.
Okay, then we had the lick that went like this. Combining two of the licks together, you know we had the, then we have the, so. So you want to make sure every time you learn these new riffs, if you really like them and you really want to master them and inc incorporate them into your own vocabulary, that you spend the time first trying to play it as close to the original as possible, but then workshopping the idea over and over so that you could say it in many different ways. It just becomes a casual part of your own personal vocabulary. All right, so now I'm just going to leave you two times through the chord progression for you to try to do this with any of the riffs that you've been working on. And then I'll link the backing track that I used, which is by uh, Tiago Lascas. Tiago Lascas. It's got 2 million views. I'll link that in the description and you could jam out to his backing track. everybody i hope you enjoyed that lesson if you want to learn more with me and with pal music consider becoming a patron where we have guitar hangouts twice weekly we interact together it's a great little community consider joining me in the live winter 2023 fret live fretboard mastery program where we also have very topic specific live classes twice a week for 16 weeks plus you get the entire course platform which has hours and hours of sequential lessons downloadable PDFs, quizzes, worksheets, all sorts of great stuff. And then in a private group, you interact with your peers. It's limited to 45 students. So you'll interact with those students week by week in the private group and in the live session. So it really helps to keep you accountable and keep you motivated. There's also the self-paced version of the course, which is half the price. But from my experience, the live version people make the most progress. I really don't know as much with the self-paced because I don't interact with you, but with the live interactive version of the course, I just see, you know, week by week, I see that progress and I help coach you along and your classmates help coach you along. All right, everybody, happy playing and I'll see you next time. Before I go, I just want to extend a huge thank you to the following upper tier POW Music patrons. Jason, Shogun7, Nick P, Billy Paps, Pete Elliott, Sean Westfall, Wes Williams, Eric Pelles, Darren Jones, Dr. Ixlin, Andy, Dennis McNulty, Paul Weatherall, Hal Jones, T. Fletch, Dimitri Unkovsky, Greg, Joe, Wayne Evans, Jeff Lambert, Jorge Vaz, Jack Williams, Joe Prengle, L.W., Dave Hubner, Fred Locke, Ruben Garcia, Kay Carter, Steve C., Jens Fisher, Joseph Alpert, 
Mu Jang, Darren, Jonas, Jesse Jacobs, David McPherson, Michael L., Brent Owens, Andrew Gunthart, Jay Brilliant, Jake Martin, William Creighton, Donald James Grass, Chris Freeman, Stephen Pisano, Trampus Thompson, Kent Gressen, John Cushman, Bob Aschetti, Derek Mickle, Sean Ellis, Jeff Weatherwax, Boomer Dell, and Joe Fleck. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of the POW Music patrons for helping to make it possible to provide all this free content here on YouTube. Thank you so much. Happy playing. I'll see you next time.